Armitage had booked them into a place called the Intercontinental, a sloping glass-fronted cliff face that slid down into cold mist and the sound of rapids. Case went out onto their balcony and watched a trio of tanned French teenagers ride simple hang gliders a few meters above the spray, triangles of nylon in bright primary colors. One of them swung, banked, and Case caught a flash of cropped dark hair, brown breasts, white teeth, and a wide smile. A lot of money, he said. She leaned beside him against the railing, her hands loose and relaxed. Yeah, she said, we were going to come here once, either here or someplace in Europe. We who? Nobody, she said, giving her shoulders an involuntary shrug. I could use some sleep. Yeah, he said, sleep. Sleep wouldn't come. Dean's death kept turning up like a bad card. Each time, Case was aware of another thought, something darker, hidden. Linda. Dean had had her killed. Wintermute. He imagined a little micro whispering to the wreck of a man named Corto. But what if Dean, the real Dean, had ordered Linda killed on Wintermute's orders? Wintermute could build a kind of personality into his shell. How subtle a form could manipulation take? They had breakfast on the roof of the hotel, a kind of meadow studded with striped umbrellas. A burst of French from a nearby table caught his attention, the golden children he'd seen the evening before. Now he saw that their tans were uneven, a stencil effect produced by selective melanin boosting. Beyond them, at another table, Three Japanese wives in Hiroshima sackcloth awaited salaryman husbands, their oval faces covered with artificial bruises. It was, he knew, an extremely conservative style, one he'd seldom seen in Chiba. Armitage and Riviera arrived as they were finishing their coffee. Molly, love, Riviera said, you'll have to dole me out more of the medicine. I'm out. Give it to him, Armitage said. Pig for it, aren't you? She took a foil-wrapped packet from an inside pocket and flipped it across the table. Riviera caught it in midair. I have an audition this afternoon, he said. I'll need to be at my best. He cupped the foil packet in his upturned palm and smiled. Small glittering insects swarmed out of it, vanished. He dropped it into the pocket of his seersucker blouse. You've got an audition yourself, Case, this afternoon, Armitage said. On that tug. I want you to get over to the pro shop and get yourself fitted for a vac suit. Get checked out on it and get out to the boat. You've got about three hours. How come we get shipped over in a shit can and you two hire a JAL taxi, Case asked, deliberately avoiding the man's eyes. Zion suggested we use it, Armitage said. Good cover when we move. I do have a larger boat standing by, but the tug is a nice touch. How about me, Molly asked. I got chores today. I want you to hike up to the far end of the axis, Armitage said. Work out in zero G. Tomorrow, maybe you can hike in the opposite direction. Straylight, Case thought. How soon, Case asked, meeting the pale stare. Soon, Armitage said. Get going, Case. Mon, you're doing just fine, Malcolm said, helping Case out of the red Sanyo vacuum suit. Errol say you're doing just fine. Errol had been waiting at one of the sporting docks at the end of the spindle near the weightless axis. To reach it, Case had taken an elevator down to the hull and ridden a miniature induction train. As the diameter of the spindle narrowed, gravity decreased. Somewhere above him, he had decided, would be the mountains Molly climbed, the bicycle loop, launching gear for the hang gliders and miniature microlights. Errol had ferried him out to Marcus Garvey in a skeletal scooter frame with a chemical engine. Two hour ago, Malcolm said, I take delivery of Babylon goods for you. Nice Japan boy in a yacht. Most pretty yacht. Free of the suit, Case pulled himself gingerly over the Hosaka and fumbled into the straps of the web. 
Well, he said, let's see it. Malcolm produced a white lump of foam slightly smaller than Case's head, fished a pearl-handled switchblade on a green nylon lanyard out of the hip pocket of his tattered shorts and carefully slit the plastic. He extracted a rectangular object and passed it to Case. That's part some gun, man? No, Case said, turning it over, but it's a weapon. It's virus. Not on this boy, Tugmon, Malcolm said firmly, reaching for the steel cassette. A program, Case said, virus program. Can't get into you, can't even get into your software. I've got to interface it through the deck here before it can work on anything. Well, Japan man, he say Hosaka here will tell you every what and wherefore you want to know. Okay, Case said, leave me to it. What is this thing, he asked the Hosaka, parcel for me. Data transfer from Bokris Systems GmbH Frankfurt advises under coded transmission that content of shipment is Kuang grade Mark 11 penetration program. Bokris further advises that interface with Ono Sendai Cyberspace 7 is entirely compatible and yields optimal penetration capabilities, particularly with regard to existing military systems. How about an AI, Case asked. Existing military systems and artificial intelligences. Jesus Christ, Case said. What did you call it? Quang grade Mark 11. It's Chinese? Yes. Question. Who owns Bokris, the people in Frankfurt? Reinhold Scientific AG, Burn. Do it again. Who owns Reinhold? It took three more jumps up the ladder before he reached Tessier Ash Pool. Dixie, he said, jacking in, what do you know about Chinese virus programs? Not a whole hell of a lot, Case. You ever hear of a grading system like Kuang Mark 11? No, the flatline said. Case sighed. Well, I got a user-friendly Chinese icebreaker here, a one-shot cassette. Some people in Frankfurt say it'll cut an AI. That's possible, the flatline said. Sure, if it's military. Well, it looks like it, Case said. Listen, Dix, give me the benefit of your background, okay? Armitage seems to be setting up a run on an AI that belongs to Tessier Ashpool. The main frame's in Burn, but it's linked with another one in Rio. The one in Rio is the one that flatlined you that first time. So it looks like they link via Straylight, the TA home base, down the end of the spindle, and we're supposed to cut our way in with the Chinese icebreaker. So if Wintermute's backing the whole show, if it's paying us to burn it, it's burning itself. And something that calls itself Wintermute is trying to get in on my good side, get me to maybe shaft Armitage. What's going on? Motive, the construct said. Real motive problem with an AI. Not human, see? Well, yeah, Case said, obviously. No, the flatline said, I mean, it's not human. And you can't get a handle on it. Me, I'm not human either, but I respond like one, see? Wait a sec, Case said. Are you sentient or not? Well, it feels like I am, kid, but I'm really just a bunch of rum. It's one of them uh, philosophical questions, I guess. The ugly laughter sensation rattled down Case's spine. But I ain't likely to write you no poem if you follow me, the flatline said. Your AI, it just might, but it ain't no way human. So you figure we can't get on to its motive, Case asked. It own itself, the flatline asked. Swiss citizen, Case said, but TA owned the basic software in the mainframe. Well, that's a good one, the construct said. Like, I own your brain and what you know, but your thoughts have Swiss citizenship. Sure, lots of luck, AI. So it's getting ready to burn itself. Case began to punch the deck nervously at random. Autonomy, that's the bugaboo where your AIs are concerned, the flatline said. My guess, Case, you're going in there to cut the hardwired shackles that keep this baby from getting any smarter. And I can't see how you'd distinguish, say, between a move the parent company makes and some move the AI makes on its own. So that's maybe where the confusion comes in. Again, the non-laugh. 
See those things? They can work real hard by themselves time to write cookbooks or whatever. But the minute, I mean the nanosecond, that one starts figuring out ways to make itself smarter, Turing will wipe it. Nobody trusts those fuckers, you know that. Every artificial intelligence ever built has an electromagnetic shotgun wired to its forehead. Okay, he said finally, I'm slotting this virus. I want you to scan its instruction face and tell me what you think. The half sense of someone reading over his shoulder was gone for a few seconds, then returned. Hot shit, Case. It's a slow virus. Takes six hours. Estimated to crack a military target. Or an AI, Case sighed. Can we run it? Sure, the construct said, unless you got a morbid fear of dying. Sometimes you repeat yourself, man, Case said. It's my nature, the flatline said. Molly was sleeping when he returned to the Intercontinental. He sat on the balcony and watched a microlight with rainbow polymer wings as it soared up the curve of Freeside, its triangular shadow tracking across meadows and rooftops until it vanished behind the band of the Lotto Atchison system. I want a buzz, he said to the blue artifice of the sky. I truly do want to get high, you know. Trick pancreas, plugs in my liver, little bags of shit melting. Fuck it all. I want a buzz. On the roof meadow, he made his way through the grove of trees and umbrellas until he found a pool, naked bodies gleaming against turquoise tiles. He edged into the shadow of an awning and pressed his chip against the dark glass plate. Sushi, he said, whatever you got. Ten minutes later, an enthusiastic Chinese waiter arrived with his food. He munched raw tuna and rice and watched people tan. Christ, he said to his tuna, I'd go nuts here. Don't tell me, someone said. I know it already. You're a gangster, right? He squinted up at her against the band of sun, a long young body in a melanin-boosted tan, but not one of the Paris jobs. She squatted beside his chair, dripping water on the tiles. Kath, she said. Lupus, he said after a pause. What kind of name is that, she asked. Greek, he said. Are you really a gangster? The melanin boost hadn't prevented the formation of freckles. I'm a drug addict, Kath. Really, she said. What kind? Stimulants. Central nervous system stimulants. Extremely powerful central nervous system stimulants. Well, she said, do you have any? She leaned closer. Drops of chlorinated water fell on the leg of his pants. No, he said. That's my problem, Kath. Do you know where we can get some? Kath rocked back on her tanned heels and licked at a strand of brownish hair that had pasted itself beside her mouth. What's your taste, she said. No coke, he said. No amphetamine. But up. Gotta be up. And so much for that, he thought glumly, holding a smile for her. Beta-phenylethylamine, she said. No sweat, but it's on your chip. Case, Molly sat up in bed and shook the hair away from her lenses. Who else, honey? What's got into you? The mirrors followed him across the room. I forget how to pronounce it, he said, taking a tightly rolled strip of bubble-packed blue derms from his shirt pocket. Christ, she said, just what we needed. Truer words were never spoken, he said. I let you out of my sight for two hours and you score. She shook her head. I hope you're going to be ready for our big dinner date with Armitage tonight. This 20th century place. We got to watch Riviera strut his stuff, too. Yeah, Case said, arching his back, his smile locked into a rictus of delight. Beautiful. Man, she said, if whatever that is can get in past what those surgeons did to you in Chiba, you are going to be in sad-ass shape when it wears off. Bitch, 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 he said, unbuckling his belt. Doom, gloom, all I ever hear. He took his pants off, his shirt, his underwear. I think you ought to have sense enough to take advantage of my unnatural state. He looked down. I mean, look at this unnatural state. 
She laughed. It won't last, she said. But it will, he said, climbing into the sand-colored temper foam. That's what's so unnatural about it. Case, what's wrong with you, Armitage said as the waiter was seating them at his table in the Vingtem Cercle. It was the smallest and most expensive of several floating restaurants on a small lake near the Intercontinental. Case shuddered. He tried to pick up a glass of ice water, but his hands were shaking. Something I ate, maybe. I want you checked out by a medic, Armitage said. It's just this histamine reaction, Case lied. Get it when I travel, eat different stuff, sometimes. Armitage wore a dark suit, too formal for the place, and a white silk shirt. His gold bracelet rattled as he raised his wine and sipped. I've ordered for you, he said. Molly and Armitage ate in silence while Case sawed shakily at his steak, reducing it to uneaten bite-sized fragments, which he pushed around in the rich sauce, finally abandoning the whole thing. Jesus, Molly said, her own plate empty. Give me that. You know what this costs? She took his plate. They got to raise a whole animal for years and then kill it. This isn't vat stuff. She forked a mouthful up and chewed. Not hungry, Case managed. His brain was deep fried. No, he decided it had been thrown into hot fat and left there and the fat had cooled. A thick, dull grease congealing on the wrinkled lobes shot through with greenish-purple flashes of pain. You look fucking awful, Molly said cheerfully. Case tried the wine. The aftermath of the beta-phenylethylamine made it taste like iodine. The lights dimmed. Le restaurant vingtième siècle, said a disembodied voice with a pronounced sprawl accent, proudly presents the holographic cabaret of Mr. Peter Riviera. Scattered applause from the other tables. What's happening, Case asked Armitage, who said nothing. Molly picked her teeth with a burgundy nail. Good evening, Riviera said, stepping forward on a small stage at the far end of the room. Case blinked. In his discomfort, he hadn't noticed the stage. He hadn't seen where Riviera had come from. His uneasiness increased. At first, he assumed the man was illuminated by a spotlight. Riviera glowed. The light clung around him like a skin, lit the dark hangings behind the stage. He was projecting. Riviera smiled. He wore a white dinner jacket. On his lapel, blue coals burned in the depths of a black carnation. His fingernails flashed as he raised his hands in a gesture of greeting, an embrace for his audience. Tonight, Riviera said, his long eyes shining, I would like to perform an extended piece for you. The title of the work is The Doll. Riviera lowered his hands. I wish to dedicate this premiere here tonight to Lady Three Jane Marie France Tessier Ashpool. A wave of polite applause. As it died, Riviera's eyes seemed to find their table. And to another lady. The restaurant's lights died entirely for a few seconds, leaving only the glow of candles. Riviera's holographic aura had faded with the lights, but Case could still see him standing with his head bowed. Lines of faint light began to form verticals and horizontals, sketching an open cube around the stage. Head bowed, eyes closed, arms rigid at his side, Riviera seemed to quiver with concentration. Suddenly the ghostly cube was filled, had become a room, a room lacking its fourth wall, allowing the audience to view its contents. Riviera seemed to relax slightly. He raised his head, but kept his eyes closed. I'd always lived in the room, he said. I couldn't remember ever having lived in any other room. The room's walls were yellowed white plaster. The mattress on the bed was bare. A single bulb dangled above the bed on a twisted length of black wire. Case could see the thick coating of dust on the bulb's upper curve. Riviera opened his eyes. I don't know when I first began to dream of her, he said. But I do remember that at first she was only a haze, a shadow. There was something on the bed, 
Case blinked. Gone. I couldn't quite hold her, Riviera said, hold her in my mind. I decided that if I could visualize some part of her, only a small part, Riviera said, if I could see that part perfectly in the most perfect detail. A woman's hand lay on the mattress now, palm up, the white fingers pale. The nails were coated with a burgundy lacquer. A hand, Case saw, but not a severed hand. The skin swept back smoothly, unbroken and unscarred. Riviera was holding the hand to his lips, licking its palm. The fingers tentatively caressed his face. But now a second hand lay on the bed. When Riviera reached for it, the fingers of the first were locked around his wrist, a bracelet of flesh and bone. The act progressed with a surreal internal logic of its own. The arms were next, feet, legs. The legs were very beautiful. Case's head throbbed. His throat was dry. He drank the last of the wine. Riviera was in the bed now, naked. Then the torso formed as Riviera caressed it into being, white, headless, and perfect, sheened with the faintest gloss of sweat. Molly's body. Case stared, his mouth open. But it wasn't Molly. It was Molly as Riviera imagined her. The breasts were wrong, the nipples larger, too dark. Riviera and the limbless torso writhed together on the bed, crawled over by the hands with their bright nails. Case glanced at Molly. Her face was blank. The colors of Riviera's projection heaved and turned in her mirrors. Now limbs and torso had merged, and Riviera shuddered. The head was there, the image complete. Molly's face with smooth quicksilver drowning the eyes. Riviera and the Molly image began to couple with a renewed intensity. Then the image slowly extended a clawed hand and extruded its five blades. With a languorous, dreamlike deliberation, it raked Riviera's bare back. Case caught a glimpse of exposed spine, but he was already up and stumbling for the door. He vomited over a rosewood railing into the quiet waters of the lake. Something that had seemed to close around his head like a vice had released him now. Kneeling, his cheek against the cool wood, he stared across the shallow lake at the bright aura of the Rue Jules Verne. Case had seen the medium before. When he'd been a teenager in the sprawl, they'd called it dreaming real. He remembered thin Puerto Ricans under east side streetlights, dreaming real to the quick beat of a salsa, dream girls shuddering and turning, the onlookers clapping in time. But that had needed a van full of gear and a clumsy trode helmet. What Riviera dreamed, you got. Case shook his aching head and spat into the lake. He could guess the end, the finale. There was an inverted symmetry. Riviera puts the dream girl together, the dream girl takes him apart. With those hands, dream blood soaking the rotten lace. Cheers from the restaurant, applause. Case turned and ran his hands over his clothes. He turned and walked back inside. Molly's chair was empty. The stage was deserted. Armitage sat alone, still staring at the stage, the stem of a wine glass between his fingers. Where is she? Case asked. Gone, Armitage said. She go after him? No, Armitage said. Tell me where she went, Armitage. The lights came up. Case looked into the pale eyes. There was nothing there at all. She's gone to prepare herself, Armitage said. You won't see her again. You'll be together during the run. Why did Riviera do that to her, Case asked. Armitage stood, adjusting the lapels of his jacket. Get some sleep, Case. We run tomorrow, Case asked. Armitage smiled his meaningless smile and walked away toward the exit. Case rubbed his forehead and looked around the room. The diners were rising, women smiling as men made jokes. He noticed the balcony for the first time, candles still flickering there in private darkness. The girl's face appeared as abruptly as one of Riviera's projections, her small hands on the polished wood of the balustrade. She leaned forward, face wrapped, it seemed to him, her dark eyes intent on something beyond the stage. It was a striking face, but not beautiful. Triangular, the cheekbones high yet strangely fragile looking, mouth wide and firm, balanced oddly by a narrow avian nose with flaring nostrils. 
and then she was gone, back into private laughter and the dance of candles. As he left the restaurant, he noticed the two young Frenchmen and their girlfriend, who were waiting for the boat to the far shore and the nearest casino. Their room was silent, the temper foam smooth as some beach after a retreating tide. Her bag was gone. He looked for a note. There was nothing. Several seconds passed before the scene beyond the window registered through his tension and unhappiness. He looked up and saw a view of desiderata, expensive shops, Gucci, Suyako, Hermes, Liberty. He stared, then shook his head and crossed to a panel he hadn't bothered examining. He turned the hologram off and was rewarded with the condos that terraced the far slope. He picked up the phone and carried it out to the cool balcony. Get me a number for the Marcus Garvey, he told the desk. It's a tug registered out of Zion Cluster. The chip voice recited a ten-digit number. Malcolm answered on the fifth tone. Yo, he said. Case, man. You got a modem, Malcolm? Yo, on the navigation comp, you know. Can you get it off for me, man? Put it on my Hosaka, then turn my deck on. It's the stud with the ridges on it. How you doing in there, man? Well, I need some help. Moving, man. I get the modem. Case listened to faint static while Malcolm attached the simple phone link. Ice this, he told the Hosaka when he heard it beep. You are speaking from a heavily monitored location, the computer advised primly. Fuck it, Case said. Forget the ice. No ice. Access the construct. Dixie? Hey, Case. The flatline spoke through the Hosaka's voice chip, the carefully engineered accent lost entirely. Dix, you're about to punch your way in here and get something for me. You can be as blunt as you want. Molly's in here somewhere and I want to know where. I'm in 335W, the Intercontinental. She was registered here, too, but I don't know what name she was using. Ride in on this phone and do their records for me. No sooner said, the flatline said. Case heard the white sound of the invasion. He smiled. Done. Rose Kaladny checked out. Take me a few minutes to screw their security net deep enough to get a fix. Go, Case said. The phone whined and clicked with the construct's efforts. Case carried it back into the room and put the receiver face up on the temper phone. He went into the bathroom and brushed his teeth. As he was stepping back out, the monitor on the room's brawn audio-visual complex lit up. A Japanese pop star reclining against metallic cushions. An unseen interviewer asked a question in German. Case stared. The screen jumped with jags of blue interference. Case, baby, you lose your mind, man. The voice was slow, familiar. The glass wall of the balcony clicked in with its view of desiderata, but the street scene blurred, twisted, became the interior of the jar de te, chiba, empty, red neon replicated the scratched infinity in the mirrored walls. Lonnie Zone stepped forward, tall and cadaverous, moving with the slow undersea grace of his addiction. He stood alone among the square tables, his hands in the pockets of his gray sharkskin slacks. Really, man, Zone said. You're looking very scattered. The voice came from the bronze speakers. Winter mute, Case said. The pimp shrugged languidly and smiled. Where's Molly, Case asked. Never you mind. You're screwing up tonight, Case. The flat line's ringing bells all over Freeside. I didn't think you'd do that, man. It's outside the profile. So tell me where she is and I'll call him off, Case said. Zone shook his head. You can't keep too good track of your women, can you, Case? Keep losing them one way or another. I'll bring this thing down around your ears, Case said. No, you aren't that kind, man. I know that. You know something, Case? I figure you've got it figured out that it was me told Dean to off that little cunt of yours in Chiba. Don't, Case said, taking an involuntary step toward the window. But I didn't. What's it matter, though? How much does it really matter to Mr. Case? Quit kidding yourself. I know you're Linda, man. I know all the Lindas. Lindas are a generic product in my line of work. Know why she decided to rip you off? Love. So you'd give a shit. Love? You want to talk love? 
She loved you, man. I know that. For the little she was worth, she loved you. You couldn't handle it. She's dead. Case's fist glanced off the glass. Don't fuck up the hands, man, Zone said. Soon now you punch deck. Zone vanished, replaced by freeside night and the lights of the condos. The bronze shut off. From the bed, the phone bleated steadily. Case? The flatline was waiting. Where you been? I got it, but it isn't much. The construct rattled off an address. Place had some weird ice around it for a nightclub. That's all I could get without leaving a calling card. Okay, Case said. Tell the Hosaka to tell Malcolm to disconnect the modem. Thanks, Dix. A pleasure. He sat on the bed for a long time, savoring the new thing, the treasure, rage. Case reached the nightclub. He paused and lit a Yehayawan, looking over the tables. Freeside suddenly made sense to him. Biz. He could feel it humming in the air. This was it, the local action. Not the high-gloss facade of the Rue Jules Verne, but the real thing. Commerce, the dance, the crowd was mixed. Maybe half were tourists, the other half residents of the islands. Downstairs, he said to a passing waiter, I want to go downstairs. He showed his freeside chip. The man gestured toward the rear of the club. I want a cubicle, he said to the girl who sat at the low desk, a terminal on her lap, lower level. He handed her his chip. Gender preference? She passed the chip across a glass plate on the face of the terminal. Female, he said automatically. Number 35. Phone if it isn't satisfactory. You can access our special services display beforehand if you like. She smiled. She returned his chip. An elevator slid open behind her. The corridor lights were blue. Case stepped out of the elevator and chose a direction at random. Numbered doors, a hush like the halls of an expensive clinic. He found his cubicle. He'd been looking for Molly's. Now, confused, he raised his chip and placed it against a black sensor set directly beneath the number plate. Magnetic locks. The sound reminded him of cheap hotel. The girl sat up in bed and said something in German. Her eyes were soft and unblinking. Automatic pilot. A neural cutout. He backed out of the cubicle and closed the door. The door of 43 was like all the others. He hesitated. The silence of the hallway said that the cubicles were soundproof. It was pointless to try the chip. He wrapped his knuckles against enameled metal. Nothing. The door seemed to absorb the sound. He placed his chip against the black plate. The bolts clicked. She seemed to hit him somehow before he'd actually gotten the door open. He was on his knees, the steel door against his back, the blades of her rigid thumbs quivering centimeters from his eyes. Jesus Christ, she said, cuffing the side of his head as she rose. You're an idiot to try that. How the hell you open those locks, Case? Case, you okay? She leaned over him. Chip, he said, struggling for breath. Pain was spreading from his chest. She helped him up and shoved him into the cubicle. You bribed the help upstairs? He shook his head and fell across the bed. Breathe in, she said. Count. One, two, three, four. Hold it. Now out. Count. He clutched his stomach. You kicked me, he managed. Should have been lower. I want to be alone. I'm meditating, right? And getting a briefing. She pointed at a small monitor set into the wall opposite the bed. Wintermute's telling me about Straylight. He looked around. Where's the meat puppet? There isn't any, she said. That's the most expensive special service of all. She stood up. She wore her leather jeans and a loose dark shirt. The run's tomorrow, Wintermute says. What was that all about in the restaurant, he asked. How come you ran? Because if I'd stayed, I might have killed Riviera. Why? What he did to me, the show. I don't get it. This cost a lot, she said, extending her right hand as though it held an invisible fruit. The five blades slid out, then retracted smoothly. Costs to go to Chiba, costs to get the surgery, costs to have them jack your nervous system up so you'll have the reflexes to go with the gear. You know how I got the money when I was starting out? Here. Not here, but a place like it in the sprawl. Joke to start with, because once they plant the cutout chip, it seems like free money. Wake up sore sometimes, but that's it. Renting the goods is all. You aren't in when it's all happening. 
Alice has software for whatever a customer wants to pay for. She cracked her knuckles. Fine, I was getting my money. Trouble was, the cutout and the circuitry the Chiba clinics put in weren't compatible, so the work time started bleeding in, and I could remember it. But it was just bad dreams, and not all bad, she smiled. Then it started getting strange. She pulled his cigarettes from his pocket and lit one. The house found out what I was doing with the money. I had the blades in, but the fine neuromotor work would take another three trips. No way I was ready to give up puppet time. She inhaled, blew out a stream of smoke, capping it with three perfect rings. So the bastard who ran the place, he had some custom software cooked up. Berlin, that's the place for snuff, you know. Big market for mean kicks, Berlin. I never knew who wrote the program they switched me to, but it was based on all the classics. They knew you were picking up on this stuff, he asked, that you were conscious while you were working. I wasn't conscious. It's like cyberspace, but blank. Silver. It smells like rain. You can see yourself orgasm. It's like a little nova right out on the rim of space. But I was starting to remember, like dreams, you know. And they didn't tell me. They switched the software and started renting to the specialty markets. She seemed to speak from a distance, and I knew, but I kept quiet about it. I needed the money. The dreams got worse and worse, and I'd tell myself that at least some of them were just dreams, but by then I'd started to figure that the boss had a whole little clientele going for me. Nothing's too good for Molly, the boss says, and gives me this shit raise. She shook her head. That prick was charging eight times what he was paying me, and he thought I didn't know. So what was he charging for, Case asked. Bad dreams, real ones. One night, I'd just come back from Chiba. She dropped the cigarette, ground it out with her heel, and sat down, leaning against the wall. Surgeons went way in that trip. Tricky. They must have disturbed the cutout chip. I came up. I was into this routine with a customer. She dug her fingers deep in the foam. Senator, he was, knew his fat face right away. We were both covered with blood. We weren't alone, and she was all... She tugged at the temper foam. Dead. And that fat prick, he was saying, What's wrong? What's wrong? Because we weren't finished yet. She began to shake. So I guess I gave the senator what he really wanted, you know. The shaking stopped. She released the foam and ran her fingers back through her dark hair. The house put a contract out on me. I had to hide for a while. Case stared at her. So Riviera hit a nerve last night, she said. I guess it wants me to hate him real bad, so I'll be psyched up to go in there after him. After him, Case asked. He's already there, straylight, on the invitation of Lady Three Jane, all that dedication shit. She was there in a private box, kinda. Case remembered the face he'd seen. You gonna kill him, he asked. She smiled, cold. He's going to die, she said. Yeah, soon. I had a visit too, he said, and told her about the window, stumbling over what the zone figure had said about Linda. She nodded. Maybe it wants you to hate something too, she said. Maybe I hate it, he said. Maybe you hate yourself, Case. Rue Jules Verne was a circumferential avenue, looping the spindle's midpoint, while Desiderata ran its length, terminating at either end in the supports of the Lotto Atchison light pumps. If you turned right off Desiderata and followed Jules Verne far enough, you'd find yourself approaching Desiderata from the left. Case walked past a vast, brilliantly lit newsstand, the covers of dozens of glossy Japanese magazines presenting the faces of the month's newest SimStim stars. Directly overhead, along the nighted axis, the hologram sky glittered with fanciful constellations suggesting playing cards, the faces of dice, a top hat, a martini glass. Case watched a drone microlight bank gracefully in an updraft at the green verge of an artificial mesa, lit for seconds by the soft glow of the invisible casino. 
The thing was a kind of pilotless biplane of gossamer polymer, its wings silk screened to resemble a giant butterfly. Then it was gone, beyond the mesa's edge. You'd seen a wink of reflected neon off glass, either lenses or the turrets of lasers. The drones were part of the spindle's security system, controlled by some central computer. He walked on, past bars named the High Low, the Paradise, Le Monde, Cricketeer, Shozaku Smith's, Emergency. He chose Emergency because it was the smallest and most crowded. He bought a mug of Carlsberg and found a place against the wall. Closing his eyes, he felt for the knot of rage, the pure small coal of his anger. It was there still. Where had it come from? He remembered feeling only a kind of bafflement at his maiming in Memphis, nothing at all when he'd killed to defend his dealing interests in Night City, and a slack sickness and loathing after Linda's death under the inflated dome. But no anger. Small and far away on the mind screen, a semblance of Dean struck a semblance of an office wall and an explosion of brains and blood. He knew then the rage had come in the arcade when Wintermute rescinded the sim stem ghost of Linda Lee, yanking away the simple animal promise of food, warmth, a place to sleep. But he hadn't become aware of it until his exchange with the holo construct of Lonnie's zone. It was a strange thing. He couldn't take its measure. Numb, he said. He'd been numb a long time, years. All his nights down Ninsai, his nights with Linda, numb in bed and numb at the cold, sweating center of every drug deal. But now he'd found this warm thing, this chip of murder. This book is continued on the next cassette.